Right, we are live now here in the room in Balmaclan and Smitty and online, possibly around the world. We have people, way absolutely. Um, I've just heard the people are cheering at home as well. So that's lovely. Thanks so much for everybody at home. Um, the event tonight is going to be quite exciting and uh, it genuinely unlike anything else we've done through the Galloway Glen scheme, we're going to be pushing the very fabric of what can be done through a hybrid event. So please bear with us on this front. We've got two excellent speaker, speakers. We've got Peter and we've got Graham's going to speak afterwards. Um, the, what, how did this event come about? It came about through the Wild Mammals at Home project, which has been led by South West Scotland Environmental Information Centre. And it was supported by a small grant through the Galloway Glen Scheme. I can't miss the opportunity to, opportunity to mention the Galloway Glen Scheme. So my name is McNabb Laurie. I'm team leader of the Galloway Glen Scheme. We're a five year lottery funded project. We're one of the seven river catchments of the biosphere, the Galloway and Southern Ayrshire UNESCO biosphere. And we're running till September this year. So we're starting now to look back at projects that we've done. And Peter is going to kick us off with a presentation about the Wild Mammals at Home project. Um, talk us through what the cameras have found in the last couple of years. We'll take a couple of questions. And then uh, Graham's got something that's going to genuinely blow everyone's mind for the second half with some alive participants that are behind the screen now as well. So it's quite good. So um, if you're happy, Peter, yeah. I'd like to hand over to you. Thank you, McNabb. Uh, you missed an opportunity there to give another plug to uh, Galloway Glens because Wild Mammals at Home came about because we did a project uh, called Moths at Home involving moth, traps, moth trapping throughout the Galloway Glens area, uh, also funded by the Galloway Glens Landscape Partnership. And it was such a success that we decided to move on to uh, look at mammals rather than moths. And as Mike now said, I work for South West Scotland Environmental Information Centre, uh, SWISIC for short, if you hear me say SWISIC, that's what it stands for. So the Wild Mammals at Home project, um, it was a three-year project. It wasn't designed to be a three-year project. It was designed to be a one-year project. But I don't need to remind you what has happened over the last two or three years. Uh, it ended up being a bit of a stop and start project and actually took three years to complete rather than one year. Uh, funded by Galloway Glens and obviously covering the Galloway Glens area that you can see on the map there. The project involved loaning out trail cameras to interested participants and bat detectors to interesting participants. Uh, 19 sites for trail cameras, 14 sites for bat detectors. Some sites had both, some sites had one or the other. Um, but uh, Swizzy is all about recording wildlife and wildlife tends to be recorded on Ordnance Survey grid squares. So what you can see on the map there is one kilometer grid squares. And we covered 19 different one kilometer grid squares. Um, some of the grid squares had more than one site in them. And some sites covered more than one grid square. That makes sense. So if I'm talking about sites and grid squares, I'm actually talking about two slightly different things. But before I go any further, I must remember to thank all of the people who volunteered to take the trail cameras and the bat detectors and install them on their property. There's a few of you in the room tonight, um, but there's many others um, who are not here. They may be listening online, I don't know. Um, I would like to thank everybody who took part, even those people who didn't record any mammals. It was still a valuable exercise to uh, try and see if we could find some mammals on your property. So this is the equipment we loaned out. Um, the, the video camera, um, we, we got about 700 or over 750 video recordings as a result of the project. The bat detector, um, which is a static bat detector, you just leave it out and it records, it, it's triggered by the sound of bats and it records the bats. Uh, and we got over 9,000 individual sound recordings. Now, the, the chill camera records in full colour during the day, but at night, when it's dark, it's got infrared lights on it, so it records um, infrared film, which appears black and white. You'll, you'll see it later on. Uh, another problem with COVID was when we planned the project, I anticipated using volunteers to look at all the videos, but because of COVID, 
we were working from home, we didn't have any volunteers in the office. So I watched more than 750 videos. <laughs> and there was a large proportion of them didn't have anything on. <laughs> but there was still a good proportion that did have things on. Uh, bat recordings, I admit, I haven't listened to 9,000 bat recordings. We have some computer software which helped us uh, deal with the bat recordings. But the, the drill cameras recorded other things other than mammals. Mammals was the main purpose of the project, but we also recorded birds. 37 to 38 species. The reason that there's a, isn't a, an accurate number is that if you look at the bottom, it says willow warbler chest trap. We couldn't actually tell from the video which one it was, but it was one or the other. Uh, the commonest was unsurprisingly blackbird. And indeed, the top 10 were generally unsurprising. Although it's worth noting that number nine there is collared dove, which was recorded reasonably frequently, despite the fact that collared dove hadn't been seen in Britain until 1947. So you, you tend to think of uh, wildlife being static and not changing, but it just goes to show that wildlife does change. And one of the purposes of Swizik is to keep all these records on archive so that we can monitor not only short-term changes, but hopefully somebody in the future can monitor the long-term changes. The mammals was the focus of the project. And again, there's a range of species that we recorded here. That's because down at the bottom is unidentified vole. We think it was um, bank vole and field vole, one of each, but we cannot be certain. It's also got unidentified shrew. So that is either common shrew or pygmy shrew. And we couldn't tell from the video which one it was, but it was, it was at least one of them. Well, the top 10 species are listed in order there. Uh, number one, roe deer, was seen on eight sites. And second most common, red fox. Um, rabbit appears slightly lower down the list. I think we have anticipated to be in there. But that's maybe because um, a lot of the sites where we did the trapping were private gardens. And uh, people don't generally want rabbits in their private gardens. So there was maybe a, a bit of a deliberate ploy there to keep rabbits away from the cameras. However, there's a few that we hoped we'll get videos of, but we weren't lucky enough to get videos of. Um, the top two on the list there are Stort and Weasel, which we know are in the Galloway Glens area. We know they're in the Galloway Glens area because the people that we loan the cameras to have said that they've seen them in, on their sites. So they're definitely there, but we didn't manage to um, place the cameras in the right place to get any footage of stoat or weasel. Polecat ferret, it's pretty difficult. It's very difficult to tell the difference between the two of them. One's wild and one's a um, escaped creature, but um, biologically they're almost identical. Um, one person told us that they'd seen polecat but we didn't get any film of poor cat. It would have been great if we had it done. Mole, we didn't get any videos of moles. That's mostly because we didn't put any cameras underground. <laughs> uh, obviously there's plenty of moles in the Galloway Glens area. Water bowl, which is the picture you can see there. Uh, water bowl was one that we had our fingers crossed that we would get footage of, because water bowls are not very common in the whole of Dumfries and Galloway, actually. They have been recorded recently in the Galloway Glens area. So we had our fingers crossed that we'd get some footage. And we did have one video that we tried very, very hard to turn into a water bowl, <laughs> but it was a rat. So... <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we didn't get any footage of water bowl. Harvest mouse, we didn't expect any footage of harvest mouse. Um, because if you read the books, harvest mouse doesn't occur in Scotland. <laughs> um, the harvest mouse has been recorded and has been recorded in the Galloway Glens area. We, we've got um, several records on our database of it, but nearly all of those records come from harvest mice nests. They make these 
globular nests in long vegetation and finding the nests is still fairly difficult, but it can be done. Actually seeing the, the creature itself and our database of two and a half million records, we have one record of a live yes. harvest mouse. Um, so it's not a surprise really, we didn't get any videos of harvest mice. Red and fallow deer we know are in the area, but tend to keep away from the, we were, we were targeting the places that people live, uh, the communities. So it's not a surprise we didn't get any footage of red and fallow deer. Wild boar, we did have one site, a community woodland, where there was strong, recent, conclusive evidence of recent wild boar activity. So we set the cameras up, pointing at the area where the activity had been recorded. And we didn't get any, <laughs> but we tried. But overall, those are the only species we missed. I think we're generally fairly pleased with the, uh, the amount we got. Uh, there's a few other species that we almost missed. When we took the camera out, you can't see anything on here just now. I'm going to play it in a second. Go back again. No. Um, When I, when I took the cameras to people, uh, they would say, uh, where's the best place to put it? And we would say, well, your guess is as good as mine. And quite often we put the cameras in the wrong place. That, 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 that previous slide was badger's steam. And this one is um, rabbit's ears. <laughs> and this is a roe deer's back and ears and antlers, but not actually the roe deer itself. <laughs> and then we also put some cameras in places where we, we got footage of mammals at the road deer finish. We got footage of mammals, but the wrong sort of mammal. <laughs> uh, the owner of this site didn't even know that there were sheep there. So we, we told them something new, but it wasn't quite what they expected. <laughs> and this, this thing helpfully tried to move the camera for us and put us in a place that was better. So um, a few of the outtakes before you see the real things. Uh, the purpose of the project was to hopefully enthuse people about mammals, but it was also to provide us with some new records. We knew that we weren't going to get, or, or we thought we weren't going to get anything fantastically rare because um, it was a fairly limited project in terms of the scale of it. But what we were hoping was that the, um, the records that we collected would fill in some of the blanks and the records that we already had. So the blue squares that you can see here are the records that we already had. This is for Badger. And the yellow squares, you see there's five of them within the Galloway Glens area, are the, the new records of Badger that we got as a result of the project. So all five new squares were new records for, for that area uh, for the project. The other thing this demonstrates, this map demonstrates, is anybody who knows the geography of Dumfries and Galway reasonably well will notice that the distribution of badges fits exactly with the location of the main roads. <laughs> um, that, of course, is not the distribution of badges in Dumfries and Galway. That is the distribution of the records that people send us of badges. And unfortunately, that means it's a lot of dead badges that have been run over on the roads. So the good thing about this project is the five yellow squares there are not only new squares for badges in the region, but new live living badges <laughs> rather than dead ones. Um, a similar story with, I, I won't go through all the species, but a similar story with some of the other species. Um, Otter, the blue ones are previous records. The pale blue ones, if you can distinct, distinguish those, are pre-2000 records. And you can see that Otter is reasonably widespread. That is simply because there was a National Otter Survey carried out by Jim and Rosemary Green, if you know them, uh, that visited all the squares in Scotland and looked for signs of otters. And lo and behold, in Dumfries and Galloway, they found signs of otters in nearly all of the squares. 
So that's why there's a wide distribution there. Um, but the one record that we had of Otte in the project, I don't know if you can make out the, there's one yellow square there, but also a new square for, for otters in the project. It's a square that otters hadn't been recorded previously. Water shrew, as you can see from the map, we have very few records of water shrew. That is not because water shrew is a rare animal, it's because water shrew is hardly ever seen. So um, within the Galloway Glens area, there was three, three 2000 records and one post 2000 record. And we got two new records uh, as a result of the project. So it really made a difference for water shrew. Red squirrel, uh, fairly widespread in Dumfries and Galloway, as most of you know, uh, concentrated in the river valleys. But grey squirrel next to it, um, if we'd gone back 20 years, that map would have been blank. But grey squirrels have obviously moved in en masse. And <laughs> we're, we're not collecting the records for any particular purpose, but as I say, in the long run, somebody hopefully will make use of them. Um, there is a possibility, a threat, that the red squirrel map and the grey squirrel map in 20 years' time might be reversed. You might find that the grey squirrels are as widespread as the reds now, and the red squirrels have, have declined. Uh, we'll have to wait and see whether that happens, but it's, it's good to collect that information now. Uh, we weren't too bothered about whether we collected videos and records of native or non-native species. Um, we were interested in both of them, but it's interesting to just see which ones are native and which ones are non-native. Rabbit probably came with the Normans in the 12th century and for a long time was farmed and was viewed as a, something extremely valuable. It was only when they escaped uh, from the farms and started causing problems that people changed their mind. Brown rats probably been here since the um, 18th or 19th century, uh, replaced the black rat, which was here before that, which is also a non-native species, and both of them probably arrived on ships. Grey squirrel, uh, mentioned already, uh, was brought here because people thought it would look nice, uh, and escaped from captivity in the 19th century. And as I say, in Dumfries and Gallery in the last 20 years, has, has really expanded quite dramatically. Uh, mink was released from fur farms, either deliberately or accidentally, um, and has also become widespread throughout Britain. But the two species at the bottom, red squirrel and pine martin, are native species. But the animals we've got film of, the likelihood is that the animals themselves are not native. Because red squirrel became extinct in Dumfries and Galloway, and um, it recolonized the area from a release in Carlisle about 1840. But the DNA analysis now suggests that a population that was released in Northumberland has taken over from the population that was released in Cumbria. So the red squirrels, it's a native species, but the animals we're seeing are not necessarily native animals. Similarly with the pine martin, which is the photograph you can see there, uh, we think, uh, we don't have the DNA to prove this one way or the other, but we think all the pine martins in Dumfries and Galloway were descended from 12 animals released in 1980 by the Forestry Commission. Uh, some of you know, may know, have known Jeff Shaw, who was instrumental in bringing the pine martins to Dumfries and Galloway. Jeff unfortunately died just, uh, just a few days ago, just a week or two ago, um, but certainly a good legacy of Jeff to leave behind that all the pine martins that we're seeing now, um, uh, probably a result of uh, his reintroduction. So let's have a look at some of these different mammals from the videos that we collected. Raw deer, obviously, have a nice browse of the hawthorn. Badger, crossing a burn. 
box, noticing the camera. And then it stops and it thought about coming back to have another look. Uh, hedgehogs under the bird table. And if you look under the bird table at the left hand side, there's a wood mouse just appeared and went back again. <laughs> uh, a rabbit, but a black rabbit. This is up near Car Spain. And apparently the uh, black rabbit population of Car Spain has been there for several years. And the, 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 the blackness seems to have um, been genetically passed on. The pine martin, which is not too far from here, um, making use of a feeder, the feeder that was put off for squirrels actually, but the pine martin's a regular visitor. This is probably the same pine martin at the same site, but a different feeder. We weren't sure if we were to get pine martin videos, but so we're really pleased to get that. Red squirrels, two of them chasing each other. <laughs> and then, one of them settles down, goes into the feeder, and uh, has a little snack. Well, we've also got some footage of a grey squirrel as well. Didn't get any footage of grey squirrels visiting a feeder, uh, but we did get footage of Grey squirrel and a woodland. Uh, another non native species out on a watercourse this time. This is a brown rat. It's not the one we tried to turn into a waterfall. It's mm -hmm. definitely a brown rat, this one. And another watercourse and another non native species, mink. So we've got one mink, two mink, three mink. This is the same site, but at night, and the same three mink. <laughs> but anybody who tells you that uh, mink and otters don't occur together, is not telling the truth. Same site, two otters. And you can really see this difference, size difference between them. Uh, otters are more than twice the size. And one of the otters comes up and gives the camera a little kiss at the end. <laughs> the purpose of the project was to re record presence or absence of the mammals. Um, but as a coincidence, we also recorded some, I think it's me that keeps doing that, is it? Let's go back on. Um, we also recorded some animal behavior, um, reaction to the camera, you'll see shortly, coping with adverse weather. We had some cameras out during Storm Arwen. I cannot actually show you the footage because the camera's doing that. <laughs> but. As far as the squirrels and the rodeo are concerned, they just seem to continue as usual, as if there wasn't a storm blowing at all. <laughs> um, interaction with other animals, you'll see shortly. And um, we looked at, <laughs> after looking at 700 video, 750 videos, you got used to some of the small mammals seeing how they moved differently. So you could actually work out which small mammal it was by how it was moving. And I'll, I'll give you an um, idea of that in the next set of videos, but there is a warning before I start it, and that is included in there is what I was talking about with the last point there, is a, a small mammal, a water shrew, that was moving very differently to the wood mouse that is also filmed at the same site. But the water shrew was blending in with the water. So it's only about, I don't know, eight second video. We well, have to look very closely, otherwise you'll miss it. So let's, let's begin with this one. Uh, this is obviously a road deer, obviously completely oblivious to the fact that there's a camera there, even looks above the top of the camera for a while. But if only all mammals would pose exactly in front of the camera like that. Obviously this is a badger. Um, 
but it certainly knows that the camera is there. It can smell something. Sniffing, I'm not quite sure what this is, but there's something here which is not normally here. Having a good sniff. A fox uh, on the same site, we got dozens of videos of the same fox going in that direction. And we only got one video of a fox going in the other direction. So what the fox was doing, that's up to the fox really. I managed to work it out. <laughs> uh, Roe deer sprinted across. Um, we don't know what was going on, but it was sprinting very quickly for some reason. This is a, the wood mouse. Wood mouse in a burn uses stepping stones, jumping from one stone to the other, and then decides to go back again. But well, the next one is the water shrew. So look very quickly. Can you see it? <laughs> the water shrew doesn't jump from stone to stone, it just follows the water down. This is a brown hare and a magpie, completely ignoring each other. I said there was about interactions, well, there's no interaction here at all between them. They're just completely oblivious to the fact that the other one's there. Uh, but there's definitely interaction between two mammals here. There's a hedgehog going behind the bushes next to the fence. And a few seconds later, a local cat. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> It didn't go after it, fortunately, so I think it had a happy ending. Uh, more interaction here, a roe deer, and in the distance you can see the eyes of another cat. And the two of them notice each other. About this point here, the two of them notice each other, and the cat does the diversion, and goes round the roe deer. <laughs> Fox, just doing a little pee there at midnight. This is interaction, but interaction by a few hours. The next morning, the local dog, what's that smell? <laughs> <laughs> so the interaction doesn't, we, we forget that mammals operate by smell rather than sight. So the interaction doesn't necessarily need to be um, direct interaction at the same time. So just to summarize, um, Certainly, all the wild mammals that we got footage of live amongst us. Um, they're very dependent on, on humans in one way or another, um, but they've still got their independent lives as well. Some of the species have been introduced or reintroduced by humans, so we wouldn't have got them at all if people hadn't been involved. Some of them have taken advantage of deliberate or accidental human activity. Um, some of them have taken advantage of the food supply put out by humans. The possibility of why there was mink and otters at the same site is because that site was full of North American signal crayfish. So there's a lot of food for both of them to eat. Um, and there are many examples where animal behavior has been successfully adapted to human dominated, a human dominated environment. But not always. There's an example here of one that is still learning um, how to adapt. This is a badger looking at the bird feeders. Whoops. <laughs> so that's my brief spell. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. With seamless interaction between our online guests and our in the room guests, I do have a question to get us started here, Peter, about right. mink. Right. Um, did you find that mink were causing a problem locally, meaning in this project? And is there something that needs to be done about that? Or? Well, as I said on the, the list, we only recorded mink at one site. Um, so it was a small scale project, so it's impossible to tell whether mink are causing a problem generally. But the result of, of what we found was that um, they're not widespread, so yeah. they're, they're not causing a problem as far as we could see. Cool. Uh, are there any questions in the room to put to Peter? I think we might have a roving look at that seamless seating there. Uh, <laughs> question there, Will. Hi, thank you for that fascinating uh, um, uh, rundown of your project. There's one quick comment, which was that 
inter, inter, unusual interactions. I once saw very early in the morning, I was going out fishing, it was like four in the morning, I saw a young fox cub playing with a badger, a young badger, right. which seemed bizarre. I right. just totally freaked out that. But in relation to the minks, um, whilst you may be lucky not to have that many up here, down on our stretch of the river near Dalbiti, we had a trapping program, went on for a week. And I think he said by the end of the week, he'd had seven mink. And he said there was no reduction in the numbers he was trapping. So we said right. our part of the river, he said, is plagued with them. So there is quite a large number of them, in, I think, in the Stuart tree. Well, I used to work many years ago. I used to work at three, and I used to see mink. I wouldn't say all the time, but pretty regularly. Um, but certainly the number of times that I see mink these days is much less than I used to see them in the past. Um, people have said that that's because otters have had a resurgence and um, otters keep down the mink. But the otters haven't had a resurgence here because they've always been widespread and common here. Um, so if the mink have reduced, and you suggest that they haven't, but if they have reduced, it doesn't seem as if it's anything to do with the otter population. Brilliant. Uh, any more questions? In the, yes, um, down at the front here, could we, or we could we could bellow for purposes of that if you want. Yeah. <laughs> Just for, to give the full experience at home, if you wouldn't mind. <laughs> In your introduction, you mentioned you were recording uh, bats. Yes. Have, has that information not been analysed? Yes, it has. It. I think the bat slide is one of the ones that we must have skipped over. <laughs> well, I, 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 I just wondered briefly, yeah, how I'll, did I'll you it. find what, you, you know, what the distribution was of, of the bat population? Yes. Um, we recorded, um, again, it's a range of species rather than an actual number, yeah. because there's a group of bats called myotis species bats, uh, which is four or five different kinds, and they're very difficult to tell apart. Uh, but we did record myotis species bat. The commonest bat was soprano pipistrelle, um, which is, wasn't a surprise. Uh, the next commonest bat was common pipistrelle. Um, those two hadn't actually been um, separated from each other until 20 or so years ago. And it was because of recording on bat detectors that they were able to be separated. Um, we also recorded brown long-eared bat. And we also recorded um, two species, again, which is difficult to separate, uh, noctual bat, which is the, the big bat, and closely related liceless bat. Uh, liceless bat was believed at one point, the, the Cree Valley, rather than this valley, sorry, my, my, uh, was the only place in Scotland where lifeless bats occurred. But with the advent of um, recording of bats, um, they discovered that lifeless bat is probably more common in Galloway than noctual bat is. In Dumfrieshire, it's the other way around. But in Galloway, lifeless bat's more common than noctual. We recorded um, one or the other, or both of them. Uh, we cannot say for certain, but we're going to send those problematical recordings away to get them professionally analysed. And in a couple of months' time, I'll be able to tell you um, a precise number rather than a range of species. What's the overall count? What you would hope to be? It, it, va it varied from place to place. Um, we, one of the sites that we did was at Lauriston, and the people, I said to the people there, do you want the bat detector? And they said, we haven't got any bats here. And I said, well, how do you know? We'll give it, give it a try. And we put the bat detector out. We didn't get a lot of recordings. We only got 27 recordings in one night, but it was three or four species. Um, there's another site, which is the one I hope to show you that we must have skipped over. <laughs> uh, another site in New Galloway, where we got, um, there's about 1,500 recordings in one night. Um, and again, that was three or four different species. Um, but the interesting thing about that site was that the, um, the bat detector records the time that they recorded the bat as well. And of the 1,500 species, almost all of them were between half past nine in the evening and half past midnight, half past 12. 
And there was virtually nothing after that. So we're not really sure what was going on, but it was a big bat party early evening, yeah. and, and then they all went to bed. <laughs> cool. um, that's brilliant. Um, I'm conscious of the question of the room, but we should keep plowing on because uh, very grateful for Peter for his presentation. I wonder, Jan, could you open that door just a crack? I think the level of frenetic cerebral activity in the room is really <laughs> causing some temperature in here. So we'll maybe just have a door open for a minute. Um, Peter, thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Please take a seat. And uh, hi. Brilliant. I'm now excited to hand you over to Graham Watson from GW Ecology, um, who's going to be inspired by Peter's presentation and take things in a slightly different direction with some things he brought from home, Graham, yes. I understand. Yes. I'll just help you straighten this. Oh, that's right. Okay. Right. Well, I'm Graham Wilson. Uh, I'm a, I describe myself as a, an ecologist and wildlife educator. So I do things that ecologists do, do surveys and that, but what my passion is about is wildlife education. And that's what I'm here. I'm hoping I'm going to teach a few things that you might not know. Um, so I'm going to start off because I've been, sort of like, been a bit of a build up. I better start off with um, one of the things I brought, which uh, it's Burns Night. We've got to have a wee sleek at Coon and Tim. Really? Don't we? Well, actually, we're going to have two in here. There should be somewhere. They're over here. There's the other one. <laughs> it's in here. It's in here. Right. It's just there's one of them is quite happy to come out, and the other one isn't. There we go. Right. Now I should explain why I've got some mice with me. These are from my kitchen. Um, they turn up fairly regularly. Now, I catch some inhumane traps, take them to a release site quite far away so they don't come back. But I've had people online go, oh, they don't survive if you release them. And they'll, I'll, I'll usually say, well, how do you know that? And they'll quote this document that's online. And if you actually start drilling down into that document, it actually bases that mice don't survive if you catch them in a humane trap and release them on a couple of bits of um, so, 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 um, work that's been done, some uh, some studies. One is for squirrels, and the other, I can't remember what the other rodent is, but it's not mice. <laughs> and mice are huge, are really adaptable. Wood mice here, I should say these are wood mice, but you, you could get away with calling them field mice as well. They're the same thing. So wood mice and field mice are the same thing. Um, they have a bigger cousin, we don't get this far north, called the yellow-necked mouse. Um, and the house mouse is actually quite rare, except where it's found. <laughs> and then there's lots of them. Uh, I actually did um, a, a, a bio blitz up in the Edinburgh Royal Botanic Gardens and I was brought a couple of uh, oil pellets and I started taking them apart and found this mouse skull in it and I took out the teeth to count the number of holes and I thought this is a house mouse but that can't be right. Turns out it is underneath the big uh, greenhouses at the botanics riddled with house mice and at night they all come out in the local toronto in the gardens Beasts and house mice, and then uh, coughs up the pellets. That so I'll put these two away. So these two, I was, I was, I got sidetracked. You might notice as I talk, I sometimes go off in tangents, but I normally get back to where I'm going. If I don't, remind me. These two um, uh, are, are actually, there's another half dozen at home, which have got to be getting released this weekend. We get lots in the house and we can't do anything. They crawl in along the roof space and behind the walls into the kitchen. We can't do anything. We'd have to rip out all the worktops to actually seal up everything. So we've just got to live with it. I am uh, ca capturing them, releasing them at a release site and clip marking them. So I just put a wee mark in their fur and then doing some uh, ca uh, captures and I'm reckoning in a couple of years I'll have enough data to write a paper on it. But so far, my findings suggest that actually wood mice do quite well once you've released them. They're still there. So don't if you've got if you've got mice, 
in the house, with mice in the house. Don't worry about, I would say, don't worry about capturing the humane trap and taking them up away. I take mine 250 metres, 300 metres away to two release sites. You may have to go further. I took a lot of clip marks of different uh, different sides and different parts to then release them and see what ones came back from where. Uh, so I'll pop these down and then get my other box up, or boxes. This was one of Lidl's um, centre aisle uh, purchases. Um, as soon as I saw it, I thought, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to buy that, and it's not going to have tools in it, I can tell you. It's going to have all my wildlife stuff and I go to do talks. So I haven't decided quite what order I'm going to do, to, to do, the, to, do these, these things, so bear with me. Aye, I'll start with this one. I'll start with a, a domestic one, which is two sheep skulls. One with his, his had his horns, one without. Um, so I just thought, it was, I wasn't going to show these, but then you had a sheep in your video, so I thought, oh, well, if, if, if it's good enough for Peter, it's good enough for me. So a mm -hmm. couple of sheep, sheep skulls. Can always tell a, um, a herbivore because of the um, teeth here, uh, the molars. Quite often with herbivores, the noses are all broken off. And the reason for that is they don't have a strong nose. They eat green stuff. So they don't need a strong nose. Whereas things like badgers and foxes and that really need a good strong nose. So their 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 skulls are usually fairly robust. And talking about a robust skull, anyone want to guess what skull that is? Quite long and thin. No. I'll tell you because we're limited to time. It's a domesticated animal, but there is some wild ones in this area. And this is a pig and a wild boar. Obviously, the teeth will be slightly different, but the skull, basic skull shape will be the same. And people are always surprised. It's a long, thin, they expect a pig skull to be... Some pig. A pig has a big load of muscle around its head. So a pig and a boar have that, and that snout, that's all muscle. It's a, a, a miniature elephant's trunk for getting in amongst them. So that's actually, so that, you know, so if you ever find a nice skull that's very thin like this and you can't think it's got some weird looking teeth, could be a pig or it could be a wild boar. So I should say this one came from the, the old O'Keefe High School when it was getting, um, it was getting demolished. And when it arrived at my desk, straight away, I knew it was a pig. You know how I knew it was a pig straight away? So it had pig written in pencil. Um, <laughs> so I, I have a partial, most of it's gone, but a partial uh, roe deer skull here. I want a full one. Um, a couple of times I have seen um, a deer that's unfortunately been hit at the side of the road, but the head looks okay. But for some reason, my wife doesn't want me to stop, get a spade and off the head and take it home. I don't know why. She's got this thing about me not being allowed to keep things like that and do things like that in the house. I don't, I just don't understand it. So um, you never know when, when something strange is going to turn up. This one here, unfortunately, this was also a road collision, so I don't have the... Um, the, the skull, what I do have though, is some leg bones and also a pelvis. But I also do have, and I'm going to have to see which tooth this is, but it's the wrong one. I've got two jaws and two teeth. Nice, nice lower jaw here, quite a sharp Q9 there. It's a pine marten. Now, this was a really strange one, and it's not in the recent gallery, unfortunately, but it's in the south of Scotland. If you know St Ab's Head, way over east, this was found right at the reserve dead in the road, right at the reserve entrance. What's, if you know the area, what's a pine martin doing there? We, and this is actually really interesting about a lot of mums. They don't read the books we write about them, and they turn up in really strange places. It's one of my favourite sayings: "Is they don't read the books we write about them." Um, so, 
you never know what's going to turn up, which brings me on nicely to this. And I'm not going to open it up because it's very delicate. But this here, and you can see it's still sort of in a ball shape, is a harvest mouse nest. And this was found in the Scottish borders last year. And I went along, just a few miles from my house, I went along to confirm it was actually a harvest mouse because at that time there had been no harvest mouse found in Scottish borders for I don't know how long. And it was really quite exciting. I um, And I was lucky enough, I said, I said do you mind if I keep the nest? And they said, yes, yeah, son, you go take it. So I have a harvest mouse nest. So I'm very, I'm very pleased with that. So um, other things that you sometimes come across are skulls. These, these two are both box skulls, found actually on the same site, but you can actually see there's a difference in size between the two. Could be age, but actually looking at it, so sort of, um, I think it's probably a young, a younger one. Uh, sorry, it could be age rather, but I think it's actually not a younger one. I think this is a female and a male. Um, unfortunately, with a lot of uh, skulls, the teeth fall out. Um, they also fall out if you clean up skulls. I sometimes clean them up. I use a uh, ten percent hydrogen peroxide uh, thing. Never, if you've ever got a skull, don't use bleach um, because that will totally ruin it and also try and keep them somewhere that they're not in direct sunlight light because that will also make them very brittle um, and things like this was obviously kept in the snow in direct sunlight so this one's quite brittle and you can actually see part of the eye socket broke it just had the tiniest of bumps and the, the eye socket broke so I was quite I'm always quite gentle with that one but these are box skulls and this one here is a badger skull, and what was what I really like about this one is I know this one died probably just of old age, because you probably wouldn't be able to see this. I don't know how you can see how far worn down that tooth is, just in there. It's actually almost paper thin. Um, it's 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 obviously a very old, old badger. And I just found it in the middle of woods. I come off the path um, in some woods and it was just lying there. And I was just so sort of like, I was quite excited. I always, I always am when I find something that's dead. That's awful to say that. But as a, I, when I, I, I'm a mammal specialist as well as an ecologist. And I'm a mammal specialist and people always go, must be so good working with furry animals. And I go, well, not really, because most of the time they're actually dead, so, like when I come across them, or it's the poo. Um, so, the you know, it's, it's one of those th things, you know. Um, so we've got all of them. And talking about poo, so this isn't poo, technically it's vomit. Um, owl pellets, I know that we're talking about mammals, but we'll get into mammals in a second. Uh, this is barn owl. Um, pellets. So if you don't know, our pellets come up the way. Basically, the way I explain it to uh, when I'm talking to people is they've got they they digest eat the whole uh, the whole mammal, small mammal, and they digest everything. And what they're left with is fur with lots of sharp bones, and those sharp bones would be extremely sore to pull out. So what they do is they wrap them up nicely in the fur and. Um, I've actually, um, it's, it's, it's quite interesting watching a, a, an owl cough up a pellet. I've been privileged enough, I think, I'm a wildlife rehabber, I've been privileged enough to have four tawny owls in care over the years. And it always, it's, it always amazes me to, sort of like, to watch them. And then you sort of like every so often you'll just sort of like, you know, sometimes you'll be, you'll see them cough it up, other times you'll just hear the sort of, so a noise and you go, that's a pellet just dropped. Um, pellets, if you ever find a pellet, feel free to sort of like, you know, dissect them. But if you want to keep a pellet, um, you want to actually um, kill off anything that's in it because there's uh, some micro moths lay their eggs on the, in the pellets and their caterpillars hatch out and eat away and they'll just degrade, degrade the pellets. So you can do two, one of two things. One is just pop them in the freezer. That'll kill off any um, sort of like any 
bigger organisms, sort of like eggs and stuff like that, won't kill off any bacteria though. So if you're wanting to sort of like, you know, um, maybe be handling that, you want to put it in a medium, uh, medium, medium hot oven, maybe about um, 140 degrees uh, uh, for about 40 minutes. And also do it when your wife's not around, right? Uh, what I would do is also wrap them in foil. There's two reasons for that. One is it's a bit easier to store them in foil. The other reason is it keeps the smell in just a little bit so that when your, your wife comes back early and she goes, what's that smell? I don't know, dear. I haven't a clue. I don't, I don't know what that smell is. So you can find loads of really interesting stuff in the, the, these. Now, this is where we're going to really have to try hard for these. This is a pygmy shrew skull. It is tiny. Um, you can miss these, especially actually the lower jaws. I, I was actually looking and I had some lower jaws and I kind of dropped them in, into a floor that was sort of like really quite sort of like rough matters in my workshop and I couldn't find them. They're that small. It's sort of like, so I've only got a, a, a pygmy shrew skull. So there we've got five species of shrews in the UK. Now the less, lesser white toothed shrew, in the, uh, also known as the silly shrew, isn't it? Uh, uh, Isle of Sillies, uh, uh, Isles of Silly. Um, we also have the ones that um, Peter mentioned earlier, pygmy shrew, common shrew and the water shrew. And unfortunately, probably at some point the Fusing Galloway is also going to have the greater white tooth shrew because that's been found in the northeast of England and it was first seen a few years ago but it was only last year it was confirmed as this non-native species which we think is actually going to be quite invasive and have a negative impact on both the common and this, um, the, the pygmy shrew. So I'm just looking to see what I've got other the common shrew here. I'll get out one of the one of the skulls, and you can see the difference in pygmy shrew and common shrew skulls. So it's actually quite a quite a big a big difference between them. There is slight differences in the teeth as well. Um, and I have, you know, sometimes you have to look at the teeth because have you got a pygmy shrew or have you got a baby common shrew or are you a juvenile common shrew? So you then look at the teeth for that. So we've got them and then we've also got another one. Now this one here, the, the back of the skulls caved in a bit. But again, this one's a bit bigger. You can see that that's quite a big domed, more domed head. This is a water shrew. I don't know whether you can, you can actually just see that front tooth is really quite hooked. And that's the giveaway as a water shrew. It's got this big uh, one uh, tooth. I think actually this is this is really great. I've never, you know, I've never done this, but I really like doing things that are um, a bit different. I actually do, a, 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 I'll just do a wee plug for GW Ecology. I also do an online owl pellet workshop, which is a practical workshop. So people that book on it get sent owl pellets in the post <laughs> to do dissecting themselves. So, and you never know what you're going to get. You can get some really strange ones. This here, is actually a common shrew, but you can, if you can see, it's still all attached. It's, it's jaws, lower jaws. So it was, um, I don't know why in the di di digesting, the digesting, or digesting, uh, digestion of this um, common shrew, the jaws didn't come apart because they, knew, well, they always do, but this time they didn't. So I've actually got a common shrew with, um, still with the jaws, attached i'm really quite excuse the pun attached to that one um so how long have i got left five ten minutes five ten minutes right okay right i'm just trying to work out which one this is um it's a yes right this is a house uh, a, a wood mouse so again have you noticed 
with the, the, the sort of like quite often with the, and I've just dropped some from there, I've just dropped it or jaw. Um, the trick with mice, they've got knobbly teeth, and it's actually with mice and voles. Uh, my mantra to identify them is if in doubt, pull the teeth out. And voles have two different types of teeth, um, and mice have different numbers of holes in teeth. So I doubt you'll be able to see, oh no, that's, oh gosh, this, this camera is absolutely brilliant. Can you see that that's uh, like the, the ones at the top, there's four holes. That's the first tooth taken out, four holes. Tell me it's wood mouse. So, um, and then here, it's probably, I'm not sure that it's going to be able to see that. There's holes in the, um, in, in these, if I remember right, six holes in the lower jaw, if I remember right, is with mouse. I'm pretty certain uh, it is. So you take out all the teeth there. So with, um, if you take out you know, um, different numbers for the different types of mice, um, here are you. And two voles. I'm going to try something here. So voles have... Um, just before I talk about the vol teeth, most of the most of them you'll see the skulls are all caved in at the back. The reason for that is the owl putting his beak straight through to to um to shatter. And basically, it's an instant kill. Beak straight through the the brain. So, can you see under here the teeth? There's a, some of the teeth have been taken out on one side. Another side, the teeth are actually zigzagged. That zigzag tells me it's a vole, and this is where we're going to really thing with the camera, see if it will work. Right. One of them is flat in the top and the bottom. Another one is flat in the top, but has a double root. The double root is the bank vole. And the fuel bowl is the one that's flat, both top and bottom. And uh, now, I don't know why it's called this. The closed root is the one that's actually got two roots, and the open root is the one that's flat. I can never, I, I always I like find that. The way I remember it is fields, flat, it's a flat field. A bank goes up and down. So the, 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 the bank bowl goes up and down with two roots, is bank, and field, flat. So that's, I'm very impressed with the camera work. This is just, this is absolutely blowing my mind. Normally, normally when I do it, so like in my online workshops, I'm having to use a clip on my macro lens and my camera to sort of go in and that, this is just absolutely brilliant. So I'll put these, making sure I'm putting these teeth in the right ones, because that would really confuse me. Otherwise, right, so... Two very similar ones. Wait, almost finish off with these, Nuno. Two very similar ones. These, this is a rabbit. And this one here has had the front broken off. But you can see it's quite similar shape, but it's also wider. Um, and you can see here the nasal passage here on the, on the uh, rabbit is a lot narrower than this one. And this tells me this is a hare. But not only is that hair, I know, I can tell that this is a mountain hair. Anyone want to, to guess how I can tell it's a mountain hair? Well, actually, I can't tell it's a mountain hair. I was able to tell it was a mountain hair. Well, it was up a hill, but you do get brown hairs up a hill. <laughs> White fur? Yes, there was a bit of white fur around it, so I was able to work out that it was a... So, uh, yes, so it's, it's really important, actually, to take a note of everything as well. When you find some... I always say, um, when you find ill pellets, you dissect ill pellets, you find bones of that, it's a bit like CSI. You've got to sort of, like, you know, do the investigation, work out what it is you're, you're finding. Um, two or three quick skulls. This one here is pretty big and quite pretty robust. And that's a rat skull, brown rat skull. 
which didn't come out an oil pellet. Um, it is actually found, I found it in the gutter um, right outside my house and it was nice and cle clean, but I did actually put it through the uh, some per hydrogen peroxide to clean it up quite nicely. If you're wanting to cl get, clean some bones and you want to just do it a little bit more without using chemicals, if you've got any green cellar slugs or yellow, if you're lucky enough to have the sort of like the more native uh, the yellow cellar slug, but that's they basically disappeared now and it's mainly the green cellar slugs. If you've got them and you know where they are, pop whatever you want cleaned up in a tub where the green cellar slugs can get into it and they'll clean it up lovely for you. I only found that because I had, I, I had a dead bat, well, I had a bat that I didn't care that unfortunately died and I didn't have time to deal with it. So I just sort of put it outside the back door and I came back, I forgot about it, came back two days later and there was this nice, lovely bat skeleton sitting at the back door. So these two here, um, I'm not going to open them up because they're quite fragile, but this one here, is a hedgehog. And this one here is another insectivore. Although, technically, I don't like the word insectivore. I think an invertivore. I don't know whether that is a word, but I'm going to say it's a word because it's a mole. And moles very rarely eat insects. They eat worms and so like that, in, invertebrates, but they're not insects, so invertivores. Um, so that's a, that's a, that's a mole. Um, the mole came from someone turning up at my door with a dead mole and said, do you want this? And <laughs> that's what I, I do. That. My, my, I should say my wife's a minister. So sometimes we get so sort of like, you know, there'll be this, sort of like the, 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 the pastoral that is sort of like needs knocking the door. And other times it's just sort of like it's when someone turns up with either something dead or something alive. Occasionally there's one time uh, someone knocked at the door at 11 o'clock at night and I um I opened the door. Well, my wife opened the door and just shouted, "It's for you!" Um, because it was a um, it was someone with a box, and it turned out it was a pigeon uh, that needed needed help. Right, I'll just quickly show three dead bats. So we've got the brown long ears. I have a license to keep these even keeping a, de a dead bat in the license so i've got a bat license that allows me to keep uh, some dead bats for educational use a de benton's bat um and also in here it's a soprano pipistrelle bat so Bats are absolutely my one of my favourite um, creatures. So uh, in, in, with, in with the pipis drill, I have a two pence piece. That's to remind me to say that's how much they weigh. It's two pence, which is the same as a two pence piece. So these, these all came from wildlife rescues that I wasn't able to be successful with. Um, some of them, by the time I got to them, were already gone so like um but they were still quite fresh so i did what anyone would do which was pin them out uh, you may notice there's going to be a bit of a theme here pin them out put them in the urn cupboard for um no put them in the freezer for 24 hours to kill off anything hope your wife doesn't find out and then put them in the urn cupboard for uh, a few weeks to dry out and hope your wife doesn't find out so um yes so i think i'm going to just Got to talk about this. This here is um, hedgehog footprints. You can get mammal track tunnels. They're really good fun. You get ink pad. Um, you put paper in, and then an ink pad, uh, which has um, vegetable oil and graphite. And in the middle, you put some bait. They love um, um, oh, what are they called hot dogs. For some reason, I don't know why, but uh, dog food's fine. But hot dogs, if you actually do hot dogs, I don't know whether you can see here, there's big ones, but there's also some wee footprints here. They're wood mice. What happens if you put hit, uh, hot dogs in, you cut the hot dog sausage up, sometimes you end up the hot dogs rolled out across the ink and then <laughs> just down like that because the, the, um, the, the, the mouse has went, I fancy a hot dog. I'm taking all this with me. Yeah. And they, they roll out. Uh, I know these are mice, not voles, because I actually also had a camera trap on the 
they're looking up the looking up the um the the track. So before I finish, I'm going to I'm going to mask up and glove up because I'm gloving up because there's a slight theoretical risk, um, but also real risk. I mean, it is a, it is a potential, potential risk of rabies, but I'm gloving up. And I'm gloving up for that, but I'm masking up not to protect myself, but to protect what I'm about to show you. So I mentioned I'm protecting it from COVID, I should say, because I don't want to give it COVID. It mutate and then come back to bite us. Uh, not literally bite us, but obviously give us COVID. So I mentioned earlier that I'm a bat, bat um, I'm a rehabber, wildlife rehabber. I've got a bat that was brought into me, or I actually wasn't brought into me, I collected it last year. And it's got a shoulder injury that's not going to um, heal. So I've brought her in, uh, but brought, brought, brought her in. I've had to get a license to keep her for educational purposes. So she's quite feisty. Her name's Pippa because she's a soprano pipistrel. And you can see these wings are their hands and that's sticking up at the top. Can you see that sticking up at the top? That's the thumb. So she uses that. As long as she has her wings to be able to move about and her thumb to hang on, she's okay. So like she's got a quality of life. If she didn't, wasn't able to do that, then it's a hard decision to make, but she would be put to sleep. But she's got a quality of life. She's, yes, I know. Um, she's chir chirping away here. She reacts when she actually sees me. She's stubbornly. I've got two in care at the minute. And you go just now. I've got two in care at the minute. I'm going to take this mask off because I'm starting to steam up. Oh, I've got two, two in care. Uh, one is called Charlotte. She was one of four young ones that came from the same maternity roost. And I called her Charlotte. A very convoluted thing because she was she was a lot smaller than the other three, so I thought she was the run, but she wasn't the run of the litter because bats only give back give birth to one live young, occasionally twins. So the four would have four different mums. So I called it. Thought she was the run. So I then thought, right, runt of the litter reminded me of Charlotte's web. So I called her Charlotte. Of course, I know Wilbur was the one run of the litter, but she's a girl, so I had to. So she's called the other one's called Charlotte. So that's um. She's, um, she gets fed on that. It's this one here, Charlotte has semi-hibernated most of the winter. She arouses a bit and eats some meal worms. They're both kept in exactly the same conditions, same temperature. Pippa here, no, I'm not hibernating. I'm going to stay active all winter and eat you out of house and home when it comes to meal worms. So um, that's... I. She's fed live mealworms, so I've got her, um, her that's her, her mealworm, that's her uh, feet, food for going on the way home, journey home, uh, in there. So they're, um, they're fed on the mealworms, I have to, I have to feed them on oh, um, porridge oats, and then just before I'm going to feed them to her, I'll take them out and I'll put them in um, a, a powder that's um, Nutri-Grub, which is um, high, high, vitamins and protein and stuff like that, so that she's getting the best. And I think that's just about me, apart from poo. I didn't bring it, I, you know what, I'm really annoyed, I forgot to bring my hedgehog poo along, because I've got, a, I've got it's actually broken into two, but when I found it, you all know hedgehog poo is about one to five centimetres, but remember what I said about them not reading the, reading the books? I've got one that was well over 12 centimetres, right? And it broke in that bit. So I've got the, all of it and it's in a jar. And it was uh, like, it's just silly. Uh, all these people that say, so, like, you know, they do, do one thing. But, right, that there is bat droppings. It looks a bit like mouse poo, but there's a big difference. Mouse poo, when it's fresh, is nice and squidgy. And then when it dries out, it's rock hard. Not that I would suggest you do, but the probably the only way you could break it up is between your teeth, but don't do that. I've, re I've read somewhere that that's not a good idea. However, bat poo crumbles. So 
it crumbles up. And one of the things I should say as well is one of my um, my most important bits of um, equipment is hand sanitizing. Hand sanitizer. Um, I used hand sanitizer years. I've been used for about twenty odd years. That and baby wipes. I know baby wipes aren't very environmentally friendly, but when you deal with poo and um, and sort of like de dead stuff and sort of like stuff like that, baby wipes and then hand sanitizer is really important. Um, so yeah, so if you ever uh, doing that, the reason it crumbles is in, uh, bats in this country are mainly insectivores. The brown long ears occasionally eat spiders, and the Debentons occasionally eat fish, small fish, which are very very small fish. But they have been known to scoop them from the, just the top of the water. But other than that, they mainly eat insects. So it's all the hard bits of the insect, all the eggs, the skeleton, the chitin, and that. Um, they, sell, like, they, 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 they digest all the juicy bits, so their poo is really dry and it rubs, and their poo doesn't smell that bad. The only bit, if you've got a bat roost in your house and you've got a damp problem, that's when the bat poo will start to smell. It's only when it gets wet it causes a problem. So I'm going to pop Pippa back down here. I think, I think that's about me. Thank you. Thank you. Can we Brilliant. Um, I'll just, I'll just follow that then, shall I? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. We do have a couple of questions. Right. If I can put them to you, Graham, if you're, yeah. um, if you're so yeah, careful. Yeah. The, uh, I've got a question here from Mr. Vine Wellwater, who asks, uh, "How I love the wee furry faces of mice, but they do eat the neeps in the ground before I can get to them. Can your experts give me any ideas how to stop them eating my garden food? Um, but she then goes on to say, I really don't want to poison them. No, no, no. I mean, yeah. Put something else down that they like even more. <laughs> but I mean, it's a, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a difficult one. Um, they're not supposed to like peppermint. Um, so if you put peppermint oil down around your neeps, but would you then have peppermint tasted neeps? Probably <laughs> if you put the oil too close, which might be maybe it's something that's like might catch on, you know. So I I mean, honestly I couldn't I can't think of anything off the top of my head that you could do. I mean, uh, you're thinking of something sacrificial that they'll go for instead. Yeah, of, I would think so. Yeah, put instead. something that they really like down. Um, you know, pe peanuts, they, they, they love peanuts. Uh, so, yeah, they'll do anything for a peanut. On, on a or a hot dog, possibly. You know, or a hot dog, yes. yes. They, um, are there any questions in the room we'd like to put to Graham after that, that presentation we've just had? That's fine. Brilliant. I have a couple of couple more questions here. Just, uh, sorry, Peter, you might have thought you were away from it all yeah. now, but just say, um, excellent presentation, Peter. I remembered you counting moths with us in Borg. How does the moth project relate to the mammals project? In terms yeah. of easiness to work with the subject, we were both funded by Galloway. Well, I say about <laughs> <laughs> correct answer. But in, in terms of the subject matter, is, 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 I suppose the elusiveness possibly of the mammals adds an extra well, element. Well, Greg mentioned the brown long eared bats feeding on insects. So uh, one of the main foods that it eats is uh, the commonest moth in Britain, large yellow one doing. Yeah. The link there. Yeah. And some of the um, one of my favourite facts about bats um, is that uh, the um, well, actually, I've got lots of favourite facts about bats, but one of them is you have to um, get your favorite yeah, oh, oh, that, that would be a difficult one. But some some moths have learned to listen for bats, um, and they, they, they can hear them because of um, some, some hearing. Uh, the, um, especially the um, sort of like the. Um, Garden tiger. Yeah, garden tiger. Yeah, that's yeah. the word I was trying to think. Yeah. So it's flying along, it hears bats coming, stops, falls to the ground, bat flies over. But the brown long eared is so quiet, it basically whispers and uses its big ears to listen for moth wings flapping. And, uh, and it will just come in and take it. And then it's got a problem. Uh, bat, the, the brown long eared to the bat. Pipistrels eat, love midges and stuff like that. So they just Take it, chomp, swallow, that's it, gone. Big moth, things like the large yellow underwings, massive moth, you know, compared to Sicily. So it's quite big. So it goes up, hangs up on a feeding perch, rips off one of the wings and throws it away. Moth wings are not very nutritious. Another thing is, if you try and ever eat a moth, the wings just stick to the roof of your mouth. So, <laughs> so rips that away, chomps down until all that's left is a head still attached to a wing, and it throws that away. So if they're up in Dumfries and Galloway, you can really show off if you find lots of moths wings, some still with a head attached, you can go 
There was a brown long-eared bat up there eating. However, if anyone's watching from the very sort of southwest, sit down Cornwall, Deb, and that type of way, all you can say is there was a long-eared bat because there's a very rare grey long-eared bat, which is very similar habits, that lives down the very southwest of the UK. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you both so much. I've, I've learned so much tonight. I think one thing, headline point I'm taking out of it is this balance between recording and data. And then basically everything Graham said has challenged data that we previously had established. And But important to gather the, da the data. The, the, well, the data uh, shows a lot of the stuff that we've actually... Yeah. And another thing I should say is that the project is now finished, but we've still got the bot detector and we've still got the show cameras. And if anybody wants to borrow them, um, you'll need to come to our office in Kagunyan and collect them and bring them back. Um, but if you do want to borrow them, get in touch and you're most welcome to uh, to have a go and try it yourself. Brilliant. And if, if you allow me to say this, go for it. it doesn't have to be in the Galway Glens area. <laughs> <laughs> I was a sad existence to live outside the Galloway Lens area, Peter, but some people do, I realise that, so I have to keep that in mind. Um, brilliant. Th just massive, massive thanks, to Graham Peter, for the presentation tonight. One final round of applause. Um, I want to thank you, thank so much everyone behind the scenes as well that's helped with the tech, and so I'll be emailing everybody tomorrow, and I will include a SurveyMonkey link in there, so if you could give us your feedback on the event, it'll help us plan future events. I can't let you go without mentioning the Fantastic Forest Festival. Fantastic Forest Festival starts this Friday, a series of 11 events, events over the next month. Whole variety of aspects of how we look at trees, woodland and forests here in Galloway. Um, and I'll include the details about that in the email tomorrow as well. So you can get yourself signed up for future events. But thank you to everybody involved. Thank you, everybody at home. Thank you, everybody who's attended here tonight in the Smiddy. And here endeth the, the, the evening's entertainment. Thank you. <laughs>